This is chapter 9, part B, on muscles and muscle tissue. So in the first half of this chapter, we focus primarily on the structure and arrangement of skeletal muscle um, and skeletal muscle fibers and the sarcomeres down to the molecular level. Um, so this second half of the chapter, we're going to focus on the physiology of skeletal muscle contraction. So how do these um, sarcomeres and these myofilaments um, interact to produce that contraction and that shortening of the muscle tissue? So muscle contraction is said to operate under the sliding filament model of contraction. Um, so this just means that these filaments, these myofilaments that make up the sarcomeres, um, are essentially going to slide across or past one another um, to produce that contraction. So and normally in the relaxed state, um, when the muscle is not contracted, it's relaxed. Um, the thin and the thick filaments are only going to overlap a little bit here um, at the end of these A bands. Right? So remember, we talked about the parts of the sarcomere. Um, so the A band is the dark band. The I band is your light band. So remember, this is what gives skeletal muscle that striated or striped appearance. Um, so the slide Sliding filament model of contraction just states that during contraction, these thin filaments, which are called actin, are going to um, slide across or past the thicker filaments called myosin. Um, so ultimately, during contraction, we'll have an increase in the degree of overlap between the two filaments. Um, so, so Make note, keep in mind that neither the thick nor the thin filaments are actually changing in their length. They're just going to overlap more. So the sarcomere as a unit will shorten, but the filaments, the myofilaments themselves do not. Okay. Um, so showing here at our muscle is relaxed, right? So we just have a little bit of overlap here in the A band. Um, and then during contraction, the thin filaments, the actin is going to be pulled closer toward that M midline in the middle of the sarcomere. So essentially, whenever the nervous system stimulates your muscle fibers, the myosin heads, so like little golf club shaped myosin heads, are going to bind to the thin filament in actin um, and form what's called a cross bridge. Right? So we're just linking these two, forming a bridge across the two myofilaments. Um, so this is what helps cause that sliding or contraction process to begin. So these cross bridges or where the myosin heads attach to the actin filaments are actually going to form and break several times during one contraction. So each time the myosin head ratchets a little bit, it's going to pull the thin filaments or the actin just a little bit closer toward the middle. So then they'll detach and then reattach further down the actin filament um, and then ratchet it even closer toward that mid point, midline of the sarcomere. So overall, this would cause a shortening of the entire muscle fiber. So remember, muscle fibers are arranged with these sarcomeres, arranged end-to-end -end like uh, the cars um, on a train. Right? So if all of the sarcomeres are shortening at the same time, then the overall muscle organ itself will also shorten. Um, so during contraction, the Z-discs, Right. Um, so remember, the Z-disc is kind of our defining point for start and um, the end of one sarcomere. So this is where uh, we can say this sarcomere begins and it ends at this other Z-disc or Z-line. Right. So as the overall sarcomere shortens, these Z-discs will be pulled closer to one another. Right. So shown here, um, so we go from here to here. So we have... Um, they're pulled closer toward that M line and closer toward one another. So also this means that the I band or our um, light band is also going to shorten. Right? So we have more overlap, so it'll show up um, under the microscope as a darker um, striation. Um, the H zones essentially will disappear. So remember the H zone was just where we have thick filament or myosin only. There's no overlap of um, the H zone. Right. So as contraction occurs, that H zone is essentially um, removed. Right. Um, and then the A bands or your dark 
bands will be moved closer to one another. So we have an A band or a dark band here, and then the beginning of one over here on the side. After contraction, now these two dark A bands are much closer to one another. The skeletal muscle contraction occurs in two different phases with four steps total. So we'll kind of break it down by each phase and each step as we go along. Just kind of an overview um, of where we're headed. So phase one is just activation at the neuromuscular junction. So there has to be some sort of nervous system stimulation. Right? So something from the nervous system uh, has to tell the muscle it's time to contract. Okay? Um, so then step two of phase one is the action potential is generated in the sarcolemma. Right? So remember from the first part of this chapter, we talked about just the basic anatomy of skeletal muscle. So how some of the parts of a muscle cell have their own special name, just to denote that we're talking about muscle cells. So the sarcolemma is just the um, word for the cell membrane of your muscle fiber cells. Um, so that's phase one. So basically just stimulating the muscle and generating that action potential, that electrical impulse needed um, to produce the contraction. So then phase two is called excitation contraction coupling. So this is where we link that excitation in phase one to the actual contraction that it's going to lead to. Okay. So two steps involved in this. So step three would be that action potential that we generated in step two is then going to be propagated or spread along the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. And then step four, um, before we can get to actual contraction, the levels of calcium within the muscle fiber, so intracellular, meaning inside the cell, inside the muscle cell, um, it has to rise or increase just for a short time. So this is what leads to our cross bridge cycling. So just to kind of put muscle contraction in a nutshell, so phase one, Right, we have motor neuron stimulation of the muscle fiber. Um, so that leads to generation of um, action potential from the neuromuscular junction, releases a neurotransmitter, causes the ion permeability to change um, in the muscle cell, which leads to depolarization and ultimately an action potential, which is our electrical impulse in a sense. Um, so then phase two, that action potential or that impulse travels down the cell, um, enters the T-tubules. Right, so remember from the first part um, of this chapter, we said the T-tubules were essentially kind of extensions of that sarcolemma. So it's where the cell membrane kind of cuts across the cell. Right. Um, and then this is going to trigger the release of calcium from that sarcoplasmic reticulum. Right. Um, so ultimately, calcium is um, kind of one of the final triggers for muscle contraction. So calcium is going to bind to one of those um, regulatory proteins of actin. Right? So this one is troponin. Um, so this is going to allow that cross bridge formation to happen. Right? So the myosin heads attached to the actin and our contraction begins. Right, so now let's look at all of these steps and phases a little more in depth in detail. So starting with that phase one, just the activation at the neuromuscular junction. Right. Um, so skeletal muscles are stimulated by a type of neuron called a somatic motor neuron. Right. So motor automatically tells us muscle movement. Um, somatic always means or is always associated with the skeletal muscle. So think somatic means your voluntary muscle. So things that you have conscious control over, like your skeletal muscles, as opposed to, say, your smooth muscle in your digestive system. So the axons or the extensions, the long arms of the neurons, the motor neurons, are going to travel all the way from the central nervous system, so say the brain or the spinal cord, um, and then make contact with the skeletal muscle fibers. So once the axon reaches the muscle, it will then start to divide and branch out. Um, so this way, every individual fiber will receive its own stimulation. Okay. 
Um, so the axons um, on the end of the muscle fiber, um, this forms our neuromuscular junction, right? or sometimes it's referred to as the motor end plate, but this is just where the neuron and the muscle are going to join. Right? So where we're going to transmit the information coming from the nervous system um, into the muscle cell. So looking at the events at the neuromuscular junction, so once our impulse or action potential, this message from the central nervous system reaches the skeletal muscle fibers um, at the neuromuscular junction, a few things are going to happen. Right? Um, so the, uh, the neuron is going to release a neurotransmitter right, called acetylcholine. So acetylcholine or ACH is released at the neuromuscular junction. So neurotransmitters are basically like the chemical messengers of the nervous system. Right? So this is a chemical messenger that's telling the um, sodium channels to open um, and allow sodium to influx inside the muscle cell. So as acetylcholine diffuses across the um, synaptic cleft, which is just kind of the space in between the neuron and the surface of the muscle cell, it's going to kind of float across here, um, it binds to specific ion channels. Right, so only um, acetylcholine, pretty much one of the only things that will fit in this protein, um, so it has the specific key to unlock this protein's gate. Right? So once ACH binds to the uh, membrane channel to the protein, it will essentially unlock the gate um, and allow sodium to influx inside the cell. Um, a little bit of potassium will exit, but far more sodium will enter than potassium exit. So this is going to ultimately result in a change in our membrane potential right, or um, the voltage of the membrane. So typically at rest, um, it's more negative inside the cell and less negative outside. So when we have all of this positively charged sodium influxing in the cell, that's going to kind of shift our overall charge or voltage inside the cell. Um, so Ultimately, once acetylcholine has served its purpose, right, we've delivered the message, we've um, changed our membrane voltage, we let enough sodium in, um, we don't need acetylcholine anymore. So we essentially need to turn it off. So a couple of ways we can do this. Um, so we have a specific enzyme um, called acetylcholine esterase. Um, so remember ACE at the end of the word designates that it is a enzyme. Right? So acetylcholine esterase is just going to break down the acetylcholine so it can um, so we can close those sodium channels. Okay? Um, some other ways we can turn off acetylcholine sometimes it can just kind of diffuse away um, and leave the area. So we said that the resting membrane is polarized. So polarized just means that we have like a north pole and a south pole. So in this case, we have a positive pole and a negative pole. Right? So at rest, the inside of the cell would be more negative right, than outside of the cell. Right? Um, so and it's more positive outside the cell than it is inside the cell. So we have these two distinct separate charges or regions. So our action potential or that um, impulse that's going to trigger muscle contraction is caused by changing this electrical charge. So this is called depolarization. Right? So if at rest it's polarized, if we depolarize it, we're essentially going to flip it upside down. So now the inside becomes less negative and the outside is more negative. Right. So again, that's due to this positively charged sodium coming inside the muscle cell um, and bringing that positive charge with it. So ultimately making inside of the cell less negative. Right. So the generation of an action potential occurs in three steps <laughs> that we will look at. Um, so you have in-plate potential, depolarization, and then repolarization.
<clears throat> so the first step for action potential generation, we said, is the end plate potential. So this is what we mentioned previously, where um, that a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine or ACH is released from the somatic or voluntary motor neuron. Um, <clears throat> so this neurotransmitter or this chemical messenger is going to bind to our um, receptors and our sodium channels on the surface of the muscle cell or the sarcolemma. Um, so this causes these gated ion channels to open. Right? So essentially it's like a lock and key mechanism. So acetylcholine is the key to open these gated channels. Um, so once the channels are open, this allows sodium to diffuse or flow into the cell. And again, like I mentioned, because sodium carries a positive charge, the more sodium that enters the cell is going to make its um, membrane potential less negative or more positive, depending how you look at it. Um, so ultimately, this results in what we call a local depolarization called the end plate potential. So this is kind of the very beginning stages of depolarization where it um, happens at this initial um, contact point with the neuron in the nervous system. So the second step then following end plate potential, right, so we've received the signal from the uh, nervous system, we've opened the sodium channel, sodium starting to influx. So then this leads to step two of depolarization. Right, so again, depolarization, we are reversing or flipping that polarity of the resting membrane. Um, so this includes the generation and the propagation or just the spreading of your action potential, which you think of as the um, kind of the electrical impulse that's going to spread kind of like a ripple effect down the length of the muscle fiber. So as long as the end plate potential causes enough change in the voltage, meaning we have enough sodium coming in, um, it reaches kind of a tipping point or a critical level that we call threshold. So at this threshold or this tipping point, um, this is then going to um, trigger kind of a domino effect. So now we have some more sodium channels that are going to open um, in response to that change in voltage. So then we have a much more rapid influx of that positively charged sodium um, that's going to trigger our action potential. Right, so once you hit that threshold point or that tipping point in your um, depolarization or changing the voltage of the cell, um, at this point, there's no going back. Right, so once you reach that threshold, um, then the action potential is going to occur. Right, so again, think of kind of like a domino effect. So once you push over that first domino, you can't stop the rest of them from also falling behind. Um, so then from this point, that action potential will spread across the sarcolemma um, from one channel to the next. Right? Um, so again, kind of like a hot potato effect. So one channel depolarizes, which triggers the next channel to depolarize, and it will spread, again, like I said, kind of like a ripple effect um, down the length of the muscle fiber. So these are figures showing what we've talked about so far. So we had our end plate potential, right? So incoming impulse from the nervous system, the somatic motor neuron um, releases acetylcholine, which binds to the receptors, opens up those sodium channels. Right? Um, and then once we reach that tipping point, that threshold, we open more channels leading to um, our action potential generation and propagation. Right? So again, Really, at the core of this process is sodium. Right? So sodium is one of the final triggers for muscle contraction because it's going to cause that depolarization. Right? So it's all about this positive charge coming in and flipping our polarity. So this figure is also showing how it propagates. So see, a little bit further down the membrane, it's still at that resting potential. So it still has that negative charge inside. So this channel um, being open, right, is starting to depolarize. So now we're more positive inside. So as um, this threshold or this positive charge reaches the adjacent or the neighboring protein, it's going to cause it to open. Right? Um, and then we'll continue the depolarization. And then there would be another protein maybe down here that's then going to be triggered to open and continue spreading that action potential or that depolarization.
right? So at the very end of the action potential generation, so once we've we've generated the action potential, it's been spread and propagated all down the length of the muscle fiber. Um, so then the last step of this uh, phase is repolarization. So repolarization is essentially a um, reset of the membrane potential back to the resting state. So just think re, re, re. So repolarization is restoring the resting potential. Right? So essentially what everything that just happened previously is going to be reversed. So now our um, sodium channels are going to close. So we don't want any more sodium with its positive charge to come in. Um, and our potassium channels will open. So we're able to pump out some of that positively charged potassium um, to get rid of some of that positive charge inside the cell and bring it back down to that initial resting membrane voltage, which would be more negative than outside the cell. Um, so while this is occurring, it's called the refractory period, just meaning um, that the muscle fiber can't be stimulated for a certain amount of time until this process is complete. So if we were to try to stimulate the muscle again, um, we wouldn't get as strong or complete of an action potential and contraction. Um, so we have the um, sodium potassium pump is one of those um, those protein carriers in the membrane that's going to um, function with both sodium and potassium. So it helps to restore that resting potential. And if you look on Blackboard in the muscle chapter folder, there are some videos um, showing these processes. So I know some of this is kind of hard to visualize. It's so kind of abstract, but um, there are some good videos on Blackboard that you should definitely check out um, to see these processes kind of in action. Right. So here, just adding on to our previous figure to add in the repolarization. So now our sodium channels are closed, right? Um, and we're going to pump out some of that potassium to help bring the membrane potential back to the negative um, resting state. So this is again showing um, the generation of the action potential, so from start to finish. So our resting potential is about negative 90 millivolts, right? Um, so it's more negative, right, inside than it is outside. So here we have our say our neuromuscular junction or activation occurring here. We're opening the sodium channels, right? So as that positive sodium flows inward inside the cell, right, we see our membrane starts to become less negative, right? So it's going to go up towards zero, even all the way to positive 30. So we have um, a very substantial change in that membrane voltage. So we have efficiently depolarized or reversed the polarity of our membrane right, due to that positive sodium entry. Um, so this would be the peak of the action potential here. Right? Um, so then once it's been propagated, it's spread and it's left that immediate area, our sodium channels begin to close right? um, and we start to pump out some potassium to bring the voltage back down. Right? So this would be your repolarization. So we're returning to the resting state. Right? Um, so we get all the way back down to that original um, resting potential of negative 90 millivolts. Right? So phase two of skeletal muscle contraction. So we've generated our action potential. Right? It's been propagated all along the membrane or the sarcolemma. Right? So this is our excitation portion of excitation contraction coupling. Right? So again, this is just saying that um, that action potential stimulation, that excitation um, is going to be coupled or go hand in hand essentially with the actual muscle contraction. Right? Uh, so it's coupled to the sliding of the myofilaments. Um, so remember, skeletal muscle contraction is that sliding filament model of contraction. So um, kind of at the most basic level, this is what's causing your muscle to attract or contract are all of these myofilaments just sliding past one another. So as the action potential is propagated or spread throughout the membrane or the sarcolemma here, um, so this is also kind of showing 
we have the impulse right uh, at the neuromuscular junction and then we generate an action potential here and it's going to spread in all directions so again kind of like a ripple effect when you throw a stone into a pond and you have the ripples kind of spread outwards so some of the action potential will spread out this way some will go down this way right until ultimately the entire length of the fiber has been stimulated. Um, so also as this impulse is going down the sarcolemma, it's also going to travel into the T-tubules. So remember we said the T-tubules were essentially um, extensions of that membrane. So it's where the um, sarcolemma or the membrane just kind of cuts across. So these fibers that are more deeper into, um, into the, the muscle right, can still access that action potential and that stimulation. Um, so then from here, the stimulation going down the T-tubules is going to um, stimulate release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So ultimately, this will lead to our contraction. There's also a really good video on Blackboard that shows this step in the process um, as we continue looking at muscle contraction. So if you want to pause this video and then go and look, um, watch the video on Blackboard um, and then come back and we'll look at the next step. So again, just showing your excitation contraction coupling. Um, so we have acetylcholine released from <clears throat> at the neuromuscular junction, right? um, binds to the sodium channels. <clears throat> we have sodium flow in, influx, um, depolarization generates action potential. Action potential is spread throughout the membrane. It travels down into the T-tubules. And these special calcium channels normally would be locked. So normally the calcium will be trapped inside here and can't get out. So they're waiting for the right moment, the right signal. So that signal they're waiting for is the action potential. Right? So this action potential will cause the calcium channels to now open and release calcium into the muscle cell. So from there, the calcium, the role that it plays is that it binds to troponin. So I think back to, we talked about the structure of muscle fibers. So the thin filament is actin, um, but there are also two regulatory proteins associated with actin. Um, so one of those is troponin. So troponin is what's going to bind to the calcium. Right? So it's going to receive the calcium ions. Um, and when it does, it's going to cause um, that troponin to change its shape slightly. Um, so our second regulatory protein was tropomyosin. So normally during um, when the muscle is at rest, these um, proteins are physically blocking those binding sites on the actin so that we cannot form a cross bridge. So calcium allows the tropomyosin to move out of the way. So now these active sites, these binding sites are exposed for myosin heads to attach to. So this is when we begin the process of contraction and sliding filament models. Um, so the myosin heads, so the little golf club shaped myosin heads are going to attach to the actin right on those um, active sites. Um, and then it's going to start to pull those thin actin filaments closer toward the midline of the sarcomere. Right. Um, so once contraction is complete, right, we can uh, remove the calcium by the active transport and return it back to the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum where we can reuse it again for our next contraction. Right. Um, so once the calcium has been removed, so the troponin is going to revert back to its original shape, which is going to replace that tropomyosin uh, and its blocking of the active sites. Right. So tropomyosin blockage is restored, blocking the active site. So ultimately contraction ends at this point and the muscle is relaxed. 
So once the cross bridge has been formed, we said earlier that it's not one smooth contraction. So it's actually kind of a ratcheting effect. So this is called cross bridge cycling. Okay. Um, so cross bridge formation is the first step. So the myosin head just attaches to the thin filament um, on the active site. Um, so then it undergoes what's called the working or power stroke. So this is when the myosin head is going to pivot or ratchet and in effect, pull that thin filament closer toward the center M line of the sarcomere. Um, so the head, myosin head, has pivoted right, or cocked forward as much as it can. So in order to continue to shorten the um, sarcomere, it has to detach. So cross bridge detachment um, is when ATP then binds to the myosin head, um, causing it to break loose or detach from the actin. Um, so then the last step is the cocking of the myosin head. So um, the hydrolysis or the breakdown of ATP is going to energize that myosin head um, and prepare it for another round of pivoting and ratcheting um, the cross bridges. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be used, this energy stored from ATP will be used for that power stroke in the next cross bridge cycle. Okay. So little by little it will attach, right, pivot, detach, and then attach again further down the, the filament. Right? And then repeat the process as many times as necessary um, until we get complete contraction of the muscle. So this is showing our four steps of the cross bridge cycle, right? So step one, again, was cross bridge formation. So we have um, a union of the myosin head attached to the actin active sites, right? Forming our cross bridge, right? Um, so the power stroke is where that head, so we're going to go from kind of an upright and then it's going to pivot forward and in the process pull these actin filaments closer toward the midline. Okay. So cross bridge detachment, so after the myosin head has pulled as much as it can, right, it's going to detach with the help of ATP. Okay. Um, so this is going to break the cross bridge. Right? Um, and then it's going to re-energize the myosin head um, so we can prepare for another round of the cross bridge formation uh, and power strokes. So um, if you've ever heard of rigor mortis, so if when someone passes away, their muscles become very tight and taut. They're not very flexible. They have a tetanus. Um, so this is due to the fact that this cross bridge detachment or muscle relaxation is dependent on ATP. So when you are dead, you stop producing ATP. So essentially your muscles are stuck um, in that cross bridge and cannot detach. So essentially the muscles will stay partially or fully contracted. Um, so when they finally do loosen up again, it's due to just a breakdown of these proteins, allowing these cross bridges to um, detach. And there's also a, another good video on Blackboard showing this process in action that you should um, maybe pause this video, video and go look at before we continue. So now we have finished the section on skeletal muscle contraction physiology. Um, so now we can kind of shift gears and look at different types of muscle contractions um, and types of muscle metabolism. Um, so first type of muscle contraction to look at is a muscle twitch. Right? So this is just the simplest, most basic, smallest type of muscle contraction resulting from just a single stimulus or just a single action potential from the motor neuron. So it's not enough to stimulate every single muscle fiber in the muscle. Uh, maybe just a couple of fibers get stimulated and you have that small little quick um, twitch. So like my eye twitches in lab when people leave the microscope cabinets open. So that would just be a brief stimulus causing that little twitch contraction. Um, so muscle tone is where your muscles are kind of in a slightly contracted state um, almost constantly. So your muscles, <clears throat> even though if you're relaxed, you're not using your muscles, are still slightly contracted, slightly toned, just due to the um, spinal reflexes um, 
that activate those those motor units right? <clears throat> mainly due to your stretch receptors in your muscles so these are things to help like maintain your posture and your balance um, so your muscles can tone or contract slightly just to help you maintain your balance and your posture so ultimately it keeps your muscles um, some somewhat firm healthy ready to respond so if you do need to call on that muscle to contract it's already started the process and slightly contracted Um, so then the third type of muscle contraction is a tetany or tetanus. So this is when we have um, a large increase in the frequency of stimuli to the muscle. So we have kind of just a back to back to back stimulation of the muscle. So it doesn't get a chance to fully relax. Um, so this would be referred to as a fused or complete tetanus uh, because the contractions, even though they are due to separate individual stimuli, they are so close to one another. Um, on a reading like this, it's hard to kind of distinguish between um, the different stimuli. So it appears as just one smooth, sustained contraction. So as you all know, if you contract your muscles for a prolonged period of time, right? They cannot contract indefinitely. They will ultimately become fatigued before too long. So muscle tissue is a very uh, metabolic tissue. So it has a high energy demand. Um, so ATP is the only source of energy that we can use directly for our muscles contractile activity. So we have to be able to regenerate this ATP um, fairly quickly to make sure our muscles can still function as needed. Um, so some functions of ATP and muscle contraction. So we already mentioned how it um, detaches the cross bridges, right? So going back to the example of rigor mortis. So when you're dead, you stop producing ATP. So those cross bridges cannot detach. Um, it also helps with the active transport or pumping of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so we can reuse it later for another contraction as well as the active transport of sodium or potassium um, back into or out of the cell after a contraction. So typically the amount of readily available ATP that you have in your cells would be depleted in just a few seconds of use. Um, so we need to be able to regenerate this ATP quickly right, and replace those stores in our muscle cells. So there's three primary mechanisms that we can do this. Right? So we'll look at each of these a little more in depth. Right? But the first one is a direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. So phosphorylation just means we're adding a phosphate group. Right? So phosphor for phosphate. Right? So ADP is adenosine diphosphate. So di meaning two phosphates. Right? We need adenosine triphosphate. We need three phosphates. So direct phosphorylation is we just directly take a phosphate from creatine phosphate and we just slap it on the ADP to make it ATP. Okay. Um, anaerobic pathway is without oxygen. So this would be like your um, glycolysis lactic acid formation. Uh, but our primary preferred method of ATP production is aerobic respiration. So meaning with oxygen. So we are oxygen breathing organisms. So that's going to be our preferred and most efficient mechanism. Okay. Um, so looking at your direct phosphorylation, right? so creatine phosphate is just a molecule that's found in muscle fibers that helps donate um, these phosphate groups to help make ATP. Um, so this is, again, a short-term solution. It's not going to give us a lot of bang for our buck or a lot of ATP profit. Um, but it does have the benefit that it doesn't require oxygen. So it's a very... Um, kind of a very quick source of ATP if we're in a pinch, right? Um, so, but we only get one ATP per process, right? So per round, we only get one ATP. So we have to do this individually for every single ATP, then it can become a little um, tiresome, right? And we only get about 15 seconds of energy produced for our efforts. Um, so again, showing creatine phosphate plus 
ADP for a diphosphate. All right, so we end up with just the creatine and ATP. So we're cutting the phosphate off of here and slapping it on this one. Um, so anaerobic pathway is essentially your um, kind of reserve metabolism. So um, sometimes referred to as a fermentation. Um, so this would be if you're exercising prolonged exercise um, and your cells can't really keep up with the energy demand uh, at that moment. So we kind of take out a quote unquote, a loan, an energy loan right, with this lactic acid formation. Right? Um, so again, it's not very efficient. We only get two ATP per glucose molecule, um, but two ATP are still better than zero ATP in terms of energy. So we get slightly more energy uh, availability as opposed to your direct phosphorylation. Right? Um, but then we have a waste product or a byproduct of this process that we will have to deal with later called lactic acid. Uh, so we're not going to get into the details of this process, but glycolysis um, is the first step in breaking down glucose or sugar. So glucose is the primary um, kind of energy source, molecule energy, nutrient, um, so just sugar. Um, so glycolysis, again, glyco meaning sugar, lysis means to split or break apart. So we split the sugar, right? um, and essentially we get to ATP. Right? So this, again, is anaerobic. So if there's oxygen available, then we would much rather prefer to do the aerobic. We'll get a bigger um, payoff from that. But if we're in a bind, in a pinch, there's not enough oxygen available, Right, we can squeeze out a couple ATP just to get us by. So the lactic acid, though, is kind of a waste product of this process. Right? So when you exercise for a while and your muscles get really kind of sore and stiff and burning, um, that's due to a buildup of this lactic acid. Um, so ultimately, we will have to break down the lactic acid. Right? Um, and convert it back to <clears throat> pyruvic acid um, right, to remove it from the muscle tissue. And then finally, aerobic respiration is our primary preferred mechanism. Right? So again, we are oxygen breathing organisms, so we're going to be at our best in an oxygen rich environment. So 95% of our ATP energy is produced with aerobic respiration. So this is just your normal cellular respiration um, that you would talk about in a general biology class. Right? Um, so it's slower than the anaerobic pathway just because there are a lot more steps involved, um, but we get a much bigger payout. So we get 32 ATP per one glucose. Right? Um, so we get much bigger profit in energy and we don't have that nasty lactic acid to deal with afterwards. So the only waste products produced from cellular respiration are CO2 and water. And so CO2 we can get rid of just by exhaling. So these different types of metabolisms can be utilized for different types of exercises or activities. So your uh, more endurance type activities, right? so you're going to run a half marathon, a 5K or whatever, um, that would be more of your aerobic metabolism. So light to moderate activity that can continue for hours. Right? Um, whereas your anaerobic is more tuned for short-term intense exercise. So things like sprinting, um, weightlifting, things like that. So here's your short duration, high intensity. Um, within the first six seconds, all of the ATP that's stored in your muscles will be used up first. Right? Um, so then we have our, our quick mechanism with our... Um, our direct phosphorylation that buys us a little bit more time. Um, and then ultimately, um, right, the glycogen stored in the muscles broken down um, in that anaerobic pathway. Um, 
Right. So short duration. So remember, aerobic respiration requires a little bit more time. There's more steps involved um, than with the anaerobic. So in your short duration, high intensity, we just don't have enough time to get all of our ATP from the aerobic mechanism. So we tap into kind of that anaerobic backup plan. Um, and again, with the cellular respiration, I forgot to mention, this occurs in the mitochondria. So I know in the cell chapter, when we talked about the organelles, what they do, the parts of the cell, we said mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Right? So what that means is this process of cellular respiration is going to occur in the mitochondria to produce our energy and ATP, essentially powering the cell. Um, so muscle fatigue does occur. Right? If you um, ask too much of your muscles, they can eventually give out. Right? So we don't have an unlimited supply of energy. So muscle fatigue is just a physiological inability to contract despite continued stimulation. So um, like when you see people that are running a marathon and they get right at the end, close to the finish line, and their legs kind of wobble and give out underneath them. Um, and they can no longer run or walk. Their muscles have been completely fatigued uh, and depleted of their energy. So typically this is due to some type of ionic imbalances. So remember there's a lot of ions and chemicals floating around triggering this whole process of muscle contraction. So um, levels of potassium, calcium, uh, phosphate, sodium could all interfere with any step or stage of this process. So this is why they say if you get dehydrated, right, you should drink Gatorade because it has electrolytes. The electrolytes are things like sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, uh, to help replenish those ions that your muscles need for contraction. Um, prolonged exercise can also potentially damage just the structure of the muscle fiber. So it could damage the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, or part of the uh, sarcolemma or anything that interferes with any of those stages and steps in the process. Rarely is it due to a total lack of ATP um, since you know, we do have those backup mechanisms, um, but it is possible. Severely stressed muscles can completely run out of ATP entirely. So when you do tap into that anaerobic respiration, right? So again, we are oxygen breathing organisms. We need oxygen for our cells metabolism. So when you undergo anaerobic respiration, it's essentially like taking out a loan. Of oxygen. So saying, you know, we'll make some energy right now and we'll pay back the oxygen later. We know that the oxygen will be available later that we can pay it back. So we need the energy now. We can get the oxygen to pay it back later. So when you undergo that uh, anaerobic metabolism, right, we have that lactic acid buildup in the muscles uh, and tissues, what makes your muscles really kind of tight and sore and burn. Um, so we need to break down that lactic acid. We need to remove that essentially a waste product. Um, so it'll get broken down in the liver, right? Um, but part of the process of breaking down this lactic acid is oxygen. So we need oxygen to, um, continue this process. So this is why even after you stop exercising, um, your respiration rate and your heart rate are still elevated for a short time, a few minutes, even after you stop moving. So say you've been jogging for a few minutes and then you sit down. Well, you're still going to be kind of panting and breathing heavy and your heart's still going to be beating fast for a few minutes um, just to kind of pay back that oxygen. So sometimes referred to as the oxygen debt. So we need that oxygen to break down the lactic acid and replenish our stores. Right. Um, so again, for the muscle to return to its normal pre-exercise state, we have to replenish those oxygen reserves. Right? We have to pay back the oxygen that we, um, we loaned out. Uh, we have to break down that lactic acid, convert it back to pyruvic acid. Um, so pyruvic acid is able to then be reused in the aerobic cycle. So then the lactic acid that we made with the aerob anaerobic 
excuse me, yes, anaerobic metabolism um, can then be converted into a molecule that we can reuse for our aerobic metabolism. Right? Uh, we can also replace our glycogen stores and our ATP. Okay. Um, so replenishing steps require extra oxygen. So again, this is referred to sometimes as the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. So again, just saying that heavy breathing after intense activity um, to pay back that oxygen debt. So the body and the muscles are able to adapt to whatever kind of stresses you put them under. Right? So we see these adaptations to exercise um, with aerobic and resistance activities. So your aerobic activities would be like your cardio. So things like jogging, swimming, biking. So um, your endurance activities. Right? So some of the adaptations would be increased capillaries in the muscle to increase the blood flow to the tissues, um, increase in the number of mitochondria so we can maybe produce more ATP, not get fatigued as early, um, and more myoglobin synthesis. So remember, myoglobin is essentially the hemoglobin of the muscles. So it's just going to help transport oxygen, bind to oxygen. Um, in the muscles. So ultimately it results in greater endurance, strength, and resistance to fatigue. So the muscles become adapted and accustomed to that level of activity right, and they're able to be better prepared for it. So this is why maybe when you first start an exercise program, right, you can't go as, as long or as hard, right, it's more tiring when you start, but the more you do it, if you stick with it after a week or two, it starts to get easier. You don't get as tired as early anymore. Maybe you can jog a little bit longer than you could before. So these are just some physiological adaptations to this exercise or essentially this stress that you're putting under your muscles. Um, another type of exercise adaptation would be for resistance. So again, this is typically your anaerobic metabolism. So your short duration, high intensity activities. So weightlifting, um, sprinting. Right? Um, so ultimately this can lead to muscle uh, hypertrophy um, or essentially an increase in the size of the muscle. So if you're constantly demanding your muscles or able to lift heavier weights right, um, than they're accustomed to, they're going to have to make more muscle fibers, which increase the size of the muscle, um, right, to help you meet those demands. Right? So some other um, adaptations would be increased mitochondria, um, glycogen stores, connective tissue uh, strength, um, again, just to increase the energy produced by the muscle um, um, so it can lift heavier weights or undergo more activity. Right. So ultimately you have an increase in the muscle strength and its size. Right. So again, the body will adapt to whatever you put it through. So if you sit on the couch for a long time and don't ever exercise, then your muscles will adapt to that as well and they can atrophy and become weaker. So now shifting gears, we've been talking about skeletal muscle this whole time. So just the last part of the chapter, um, just kind of briefly touching on smooth muscle. Um, so again, we don't really talk about cardiac muscle in this chapter because in anatomy two, um, when we talk about the heart, there is a whole section where we delve into cardiac muscle itself. Um, so smooth muscle, uh, we've said before, is found in the walls of the hollow organs um, like the digestive system, um, some blood vessels. Uh, so to compare contrast with your skeletal muscle fibers, so skeletal muscle fibers are called fibers because they're like long, thin threads or fibers, um, whereas smooth muscle is smooth. So it doesn't have those striations or that striped appearance like skeletal muscle. Um, it only has one nucleus because the cells themselves are pretty short and thin. Right? So it only needs one nucleus. Um, and they're also spindle shaped. So they're not long, thin, like thread fiber shaped. They're kind of spindle um, or fusiform flattened shaped. Right? Um, and in terms of the connective tissue layers, they are only going to contain an endomysium. So they don't have the same arrangement like skeletal muscle where we have the fibers bundled into fascicles and all of that, where we need different 
levels or layers of connective tissue. So smooth muscle is generally only kind of in a sheet arrangement. So we only have that one connective tissue layer. So the smooth muscle in the digestive system um, usually is found in actually two opposing layers or sheets of muscle tissue. So you will have a longitudinal layer where the muscle cells are kind of arranged long ways down the length of the muscle. Um, and then you'll have a circular layer right, where they are arranged kind of perpendicular to the other layer. Um, so the longitudinal layer running parallel to the long axis or long ways down the muscle. Um, so this allows the overall organ to shorten and contract just like a normal skeletal muscle. Whereas the circular layer, since they run around in a circle, when they contract, it's going to um, constrict the opening or the diameter of this organ, right? So um, we can essentially cause um, the lumen or the opening to constrict. So these um, circular layers of smooth muscle are what form your sphincters, right? So we want to um, close off maybe um, where the stomach empties into the intestine, right, is a sphincter, the pyloric sphincter. So it the smooth muscle will contract to close right, and it will relax to open. So these two layers of smooth muscle allow what's called peristalsis. So peristalsis is the mechanism by which we propel food and things through our digestive system. Um, so it's essentially alternating contractions and relaxations of the layers that help to mix and squeeze substances through the digestive system and the hollow organs. So when food travels through your intestines, it doesn't just slide straight through. So it's kind of gradually squeezed a little bit at a time all along the length of the intestines and the digestive tract. So again, showing those longitudinal layers, you can kind of see the arrangement of the fibers here. Right? They're going end to end this way. And your circular layer, the fibers are going around. Um, so some other differences with your smooth muscle. So they don't have a neuromuscular junction as in skeletal muscle. So the neuromuscular junction of skeletal muscle remember, was a somatic motor neuron. So somatic meaning voluntary. Um, smooth muscle is not voluntary. So we don't have conscious control over our smooth muscle, our intestines, and our blood vessels. Um, so it has autonomic nerve fibers. Right? Um, so autonomic, think your automatic. Right? So it's not um, consciously controlled. Right? So your autonomic or your automatic nerve fibers um, are what's going to innervate the smooth muscle. Um, and instead of having kind of a single um, axon terminal for every fiber, we have what's called a varicosity. Um, so we have kind of just these bulbous swellings or these little knots of nerve fibers that form kind of like a net or a mesh around the smooth muscle tissue. Uh, but they're essentially going to serve the same purpose as the neuromuscular junction in that they're going to release neurotransmitters right, and send the signals to the smooth muscle. So some other differences from skeletal muscle. Um, it does not have sarcomeres, right, myofibrils, or T-tubules. So again, this goes back to... Um, that absence of the striation. So smooth muscle is not striped or striated like skeletal muscle because it doesn't have those sarcomeres. Um, so it still has the myofilaments, but they're just arranged diagonally right, um, instead of horizontally. Um, also, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a little bit less developed, so it does store some calcium. Um, but because they're smaller, most of their calcium is going to come from an extracellular area. Um, and the sarcolemma contains pouch-like infoldings called caviole. So the caviole are what's going to um, open and allow that influx of the calcium into the cell. Okay. Um, 
So then another difference between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. So remember skeletal muscle, the calcium binds to troponin, right? So when the calcium binds to troponin, it changes its shape, which allows myosin to attach. In smooth muscle, calcium binds to calmodulin. Uh, it'll have a similar effect though in that it just allows the contraction to occur. Um, and then finally, another difference between your skeletal and smooth muscle. So when skeletal muscle contracts, it contracts, right? longitudinally so it contracts kind of straight in a straight line uh, contraction whereas um, the smooth muscle cells when they contract because the myofilaments are arranged in this diagonal manner um, it causes the smooth muscle cells to contract in a kind of corkscrew manner So finally, to finish up, just compare and contrast, again, the three types of muscle tissue. So skeletal muscle attaches to the skeleton, right? So the fibers are very long, cylindrical. They have multiple nuclei and obvious striations, right? um, So again, the reason that skeletal muscle needs multiple nucleuses or nuclei um, is because, remember, one muscle fiber can be two to three foot long, the entire length of your thigh muscle, right, of your leg. Um, so the nucleus contains the DNA, which goes for the protein. Muscles need lots of protein. So we don't have time for, um, say, if the part of your muscle cell near your knee needed some protein, but the nucleus is all the way up near your hip, right? That would take too long to get that protein it needs. So it has multiple nuclei kind of all throughout the length of the muscle fibers, right? So every area of the muscle cell is able to get the proteins it needs when it needs it. Cardiac muscle found in the walls of the heart. Um, so it is striated, but its fibers are much shorter um, and sometimes branched. Right? So again, if you think about it, the heart is a pretty small organ compared to, say, your thigh muscle, right, which would have a larger fiber. Um, and then finally, smooth muscle um, found in the walls of the hollow visceral organs like the digestive tract, um, some of the blood vessels, airways, um, and the eye muscle. So smooth muscle um, has the fusiform or the kind of flattened um, spindle-shaped cells that are pretty small and short. They only have one nucleus because they're small um, and they have no striation.